Hello and welcome to The Exchange. Political correctness has always been a great subject for debate. Does it exist as a safeguard against prejudice or is it just a term used to limit our freedom of speech? We'll take a look at what being politically correct means. Has it gone too far? Have we become a nanny state? Everybody has an opinion, but when we try to be politically correct, we often minimise the potential to offend other people. We go to great lengths to avoid offence. But do we sometimes take it just too far? Shouldn't we just say what we feel? Where has our freedom of speech gone? Has political correctness gone mad? Dr Robert Sparrow is an Australian Research Council Future Fellow in the Philosophy Program and Associate Professor in the Centre for Human Bioethics at Monash University where he works on ethical issues raised by new technologies. Dr Kevin Donnelly is one of Australia's leading educational commentators and authors. Kevin is the Executive Director of the Education Standards Institute and a Research Fellow at the Australian Catholic University. Welcome to you both. It's great to have you guys here. First of all, uh, Rob, could you maybe define for us what do we mean when we use the term political correctness? Look, I think there's two things that people mean uh, when they talk about political correctness. Uh, there's just a sort of general sense of the institutions and understandings that shape uh, what we feel it's appropriate to say and when and how that speech is received. Uh, and that's a general uh, phenomenon. There's lots of things that I'm not going to say on this uh, television program because right. they would be edited out or get us all arrested. And then there's, a, um, then there's a use that's essentially an example of what it's trying to criticise, where you describe views that you don't like as being politically correct or an example of political oh, okay. correctness as a way <coughs> of actually trying to silence people. And so that's just the kind of boo word. I don't like the fact that people are uh, criticising a comedian for being sexist, so I say, oh, that's terrible political correctness. Right, OK, mm, so, so it's it kind of a reverse. It's overused sometimes, yeah. 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 Um, normally when we talk about political correctness, we're, correctness rather, we're, we're talking about uh, maybe sexual references or racist references. Are there any other examples today? Well, there are quite a few examples and in terms of where it came from, I think it's important to understand that during the 70s and 80s, especially in America, on the university campuses, a lot of the left, cultural left as I call them, progressive people, people often quite radical, argued against what they saw as a more conservative approach to what you studied and the language you used. And so I think it began really as a form of censorship. And that is the problem that I have with it, because instead of having free and open debate, we often close it down by saying straight away, well, that's politically correct. He's homophobic, he's patriarchal, misogynist. Rather than debating the argument, we often have a go at the person. And I think that's what you were referring to, Robert, a little bit earlier. Well, I, I mean, I think it's surprising to uh, say that we shouldn't uh, think about what we teach uh, in our classes and in our courses. I mean, I, I, I know Kevin's written about the philosophy of education. I'm sure he thinks there's some books that should be taught and some books that shouldn't be taught. We're always going to have that conversation. I mean, if I turn up to a biology lecture, I don't want someone, you know, rabbiting on about politics. So mm. uh, it seems a bit silly to me to describe uh, a debate about what it's appropriate to be teaching as censorship. That's actually just uh, an ordinary part of uh, intellectual and university life, is thinking about what do we want to teach, how do we want to teach it, uh, which books are appropriate. Well, what about informative education? Um, is there a place for, uh, I guess, teaching um, areas of political correctness there? I mean, I, I said a little thing with my, my children, you know, um, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and I didn't say the, <laughs> the, the obvious word, and that's teaching children to be kind to others. But is there a, an age where you think pe people should be guided and then have an open, an open book, so to Look, speak? Look, if you weren't teaching your children values, uh, you wouldn't be a good parent. Uh, of course, you teach your children to use language. Um, words mean some things and not others. Uh, and if you're not teaching grammatical correctness, you're not teaching uh, the English language. And yes, of course, you should teach your children to uh, be respectful, to have a sense of what it's appropriate uh, 
to say and where. Again, I mean, it's not just uh, racism. I mean, if the uh, child comes to uh, uh, comes to school and, kin and kindergarten and starts talking about what you got up to in the bedroom last night, you wouldn't feel that was appropriate. Um, yeah, we educate our children uh, into values and we should think, are those values sexist and racist? I hope not. Mm. Kevin, in the Australian education system, um, how much political correctness do you think is taught? Well, when you look at, say, primary school in particular, there have been quite a number of examples where books have been taken out of the library because they're politically incorrect. I mean, one example would be Little Black Sambo, which I used to read to my children, yep. uh, about you know running around and being chased by a tiger, I think it was, yes. and turning into ghee, butter. That's right. Now, some which people... Which is are... what happens when tigers run around. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. But some people, I think, went too far in saying, well, we have to take that book off the shelf because it might offend people. Uh, I think that's, frankly, ridiculous. I mean, there are other examples fairy tales like Cinderella, you know, there was an English headmistress some years ago who argued that fairy tales like that should not be in the school because it gave a very biased, one-sided view where the happy ending was marrying the prince, where a man and a woman, in this case, prince and princess, got married. Another example, Romeo and Juliet, uh, a teacher refused to teach that because it privileged heterosexual relationships because the idea was, again, a man and a woman. So I think we have to be careful here that it doesn't become a form of censorship. We can go too far. Rob? Are, are you saying that, that you should be able to teach any book at school or kindergarten? I mean, say I take Playboy into the kindergarten and I say, look, here's a good education. Look, look this is how, <laughs> how babies were made. W would you not want to take that book out of the library? If there is, like Playboy, where you have commodification of women and treating women as sexual objects, then in that instance, I would say there's probably no room for Playboy. But I think we've lost that battle, given the internet and the amount of sexting and uh, pornography now that's out there. But, but it is but appropriate there are, to I'm, take I'm, books out of school. It's, it's appropriate, it's entirely appropriate to have a think, of, uh, a think about what our children are being taught. Sure. And so these do not reflect the, um, the values that, as an inclusive society, uh, we want to live by. That's the debate obviously we're having as to where you draw the line. Where would and, you and, draw and, the line, Rob? Just out of my argument is we've gone too far. Would, would, yeah. uh, would Cinderella be banned? Or should, should Cinderella? I'm not convinced that Cinderella has been banned anywhere. Okay, I mean, one sure. of the weird things about this debate about political correctness is it's always anecdotal. Somewhere, you know, um, someone did something that we can all have a laugh and say uh, is silly. Yeah. I mean, actually, in the real world of curriculum design, difficult choices about values are being made. Uh, all the time. And it's not just uh, concerns about, you know, uh, racism and sexism. It's uh, a story that teaches that it's uh, um, perhaps o OK to overthrow your own government, uh, for instance. You know, uh, is that something uh, we want in the school curriculum? Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, there's a whole series of things that people uh, essentially uh, should be having a debate about. Um, so I'm not convinced that at the moment, you know, white, heterosexual, uh, powerful people are in any fear that they can't speak their minds. I mean, you know, John, look at this panel. Look at this panel. Right yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I just can't <laughs> see it that, uh, that, this is, that there's any kind of, you know, systematic campaign of censorship from the left. I will say, though, that in America over the last couple of years there have been a number of examples where university professors have actually been uh, penalised or criticised. One or two have lost their job for what ostensibly seems to be political correctness. I mean... Well, give, us, give us an example. Well, one example, uh, 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 a tutor, professor, marked an essay for an, uh, a black American, uh, and I'm not sure what the correct term is, an American of colour or black American, and she'd written Indigenous with a capital I. He changed it to lowercase. And she lodged a formal complaint that he was undervaluing her identity because he'd corrected that. So is that oversensitivity or is that because of historical issues that we... Well, I that think it's the fact that? that, again, the universities are areas that are open to this kind of criticism. I mean, for example, if you're at a university where, again, uh, some of the examples in the book I have here, where 
literature was based very much on the European canon. Milton, Shakespeare, Jane Austen, uh, a number of universities changed that to cultural studies where you didn't study dwems or dead white European males, you studied contemporary <laughs> literature which was all about gender, ethnicity, class, what I call the new trinity. So it actually does have a significant effect on what you can study. OK. We need to go to a break in just a moment, but Robert, really, really interested in getting your uh, feedback uh, to this. The impact of political correctness um, on honest assessment and debate, where, where do you see that going at the moment? Is it dampening our ability to actually have a good conversation respectfully? So here's an example of political correctness that people perhaps wouldn't immediately recognise as such. Take the uh, Commonwealth Government's anti-terror legislation uh, that makes it a criminal offence to advocate armed struggle against the Australian Armed Forces or to advocate um, you know, violence against members of a, a political group. Uh, that makes some uh, teaching of some arguments in political philosophy uh, quite difficult. Okay, it is possible to have an unjust war, for instance. That's something I need to teach in my, uh, in when I teach just war theory, that the possibility that your government might be involved in doing something that's morally wrong, yeah. that the upright person might well resist it. You need to be a bit cautious about saying that nowadays yes. as a result of legislation, not, you know, trendy leftists, but yep. government legislation that can put you in prison uh, if you uh, say certain things in a... Uh, uncautious manner. Okay. So I think that does interfere with our ability to debate certain issues. I think that a public culture in which everyone is able to participate because they're not subject to racist and sexist mockery, uh, I think that actually improves our capacity uh, to think clearly about the issues that we face. That yeah. when we narrow the range of opinion available to us because uh, we exclude certain points of views, that's actually bad for the way uh, in which we can deal with those issues. Sure. Yeah. We need to take a break. If you'd like to know more about our show, don't forget to head over to the website. We'll be back with Street Talk and more right after this. <laughs> Politically correct interfering with our freedom of speech, do you think? Um, I think a lot of people aren't really aware of political correctness, in all honesty. Yes. How so? Good question. No, I don't think so. You don't think so at all? Uh, no. no. I think certain things are totally appropriate. I think it actually is to a certain extent. Um, I mean, obviously, there are things that need to be adjusted with what we speak about. Um, and we do need to be politically correct in certain circumstances, but not all the time. I think that we're taking a lot of things a little bit too far. Is being politically correct interfering with our freedom of speech? That's a tough one. Quite possibly, I think so, yes. Yes and no, because um, in times that sometimes you could be joking about something, it could be taken out of context. I suppose it's a very fine line. We do need to make sure we're being conscious about other people's cultures. Look, it's a balancing act, I think. Um, you know, you've got to balance everything and, and whether the, the harm or offence actually is an important thing to take into consideration. And actually thinking, well, if I was on the receiving end of this, how would I feel about it? And I think if we do that, then that sometimes answers the question. I've had cases where people have actually said something that they didn't realise um, made me upset, but then, um, but if you didn't actually tell them, they wouldn't know. I'll give you an example. If, if kids are singing Bar Bar Rainbow Sheep yeah. as opposed to Bar Bar Black Sheep, what do you think about that? I think that's crazy. Well, it doesn't remind me of my childhood. <laughs> Definitely not. It's a bit over the top. If you make it wrong at the start, then it's going to cause issues. Where if you just leave it as it is, it's not, it doesn't mean anything. Colour is a colour, as long as you're not being racist. I honestly think it's ridiculous. I mean, kids aren't going to be singing Baba Black Sheep and, you know, associating it with something racist. Well, it's about a black sheep. I don't know if it's actually meant to be about, uh, you know, something else that it's meant to be a symbol for. And do you think there's a place for people not to be politically correct? Uh, no. 
I think definitely, especially when it comes to young children. I mean, it's kind of like we're teaching them um, to be too careful about everything. In your own home. What you might say at home isn't what you'd say on Twitter. <laughs> People need to remember that. <laughs> uh, or what they'd say in context. And that might be a way that we actually let out some of the frustrations or the, the energy that we have about something. Definitely say we're going overboard. Welcome back. We're having an exchange about political correctness. Are we in danger of becoming a nanny state or are we already there? Our Street Talk <laughs> reporter, Sandra Cavallo, welcome. Hi, how are you going? Really good. Were what? you surprised at, at how people were on the street? No, I think it was quite balanced actually. Um, I think uh, I had quite a range of different thoughts. Uh, I think everybody agreed that Baba Black Sheep uh, <laughs> needs to stay as Baba Black Sheep and not as Baba Rainbow Sheep. Or White Sheep. And you've got or a quizzical look, Rob. What do you think yeah. about Baba uh, Black Sheep? Um, I simply don't believe the story that anyone has ever encouraged <laughs> children to sing Baba Rainbow Sheep. This seems like a completely uh, sort of no, uh, no, no. false... No, I, I agree with you, but if people did suggest that, would that be ridiculous? Uh, it's, it's kind of strange to, to draw conclusions about uh, contemporary politics of speech from a completely imaginary <laughs> example. I mean, yeah, okay, yeah we, well, can, we can all have a laugh. Baba Rainbow Sheep, uh, we know uh, that would be silly because we know it's, as one of the uh, people being interviewed said, it's just about a sheep. But take the rhyme that you weren't willing to finish uh, in discussion, uh, might have been off camera discussion, but uh, you know, any, many, miny, no, catch yes. up, yes. next word. Uh, by, by the, the toe. toe. I'm not sure that people should be defending that. That's clear. That is clearly racist, oh, and I you shouldn't be teaching. That. I would agree yes. with that. Yes. Yes. What so, about though, when mm. where we feel that maybe it's being carried too far? So, well, for example, a... some of the things that I grew up with, that uh, you know, Andy Pandy, uh, Teddy yeah. in the basket. You know, what were they doing? Uh, the gollywog, all of that kind of thing. Are we going too far in censoring some of these supposedly innocent children's stories? Well, I believe we have, and I'll give one example, and I read it in the newspaper, so I assume it's it true. true. <laughs> I assume it's true. Uh, a, a primary school in, in Melbourne where they changed the words to Kookaburra sits on the old gum tree. Yep. Uh, because in the song, it talks about gay. So they changed the word. Now, that caused a bit of a furor amongst the school community mm. because some parents felt, well, how far do you want to go? in terms of changing nursery rhymes or songs and they argued, some of the parents, it was too politically correct. Now, I think there are other examples though that are far more important in terms of the effect it's having, say, at universities. Uh, and I've mentioned America uh, before. Uh, one of them is now what they call uh, trigger points where they are looking at literature, for example, or history, and saying if you're reading something like Huckleberry Finn, where there's a runaway slave, uh, students have complained about that Mark Twain book because of the treatment of the slave mm. and the fact that we don't want to read this because we find it, as black Americans, offensive. So do they put a trigger warning in the book? Well, how, how far do you go? One of my favourite poems, and I won't recite it, is uh, Marvell's To His Coy Mistress, where he talks about a woman and how he'd like to consummate their relationship. And he talks about her body, and some of it quite explicit. It's a lovely poem, metaphysical, you know, hundreds of years old, but some universities have banned it because they argue it commodifies women, it's sexist, it will offend young girls. Now, the minute we start doing that, I think we're down a slippery slope towards censorship. And if you know George Orwell, uh, the English author, 1984, he argued that words are often used to impose censorship. So we have to be careful. Mm. So, Kevin, are you opposed to all censorship? There is a place for censorship. I mean... So it can hardly be a slippery slope to censorship. I mean, well, we, all, we all agree that there are some things that it's not appropriate to... Uh, say and read in some context. So, True. So, so what, it can't what, be... What would you guys agree <laughs> on that we should be censoring? Uh, well, open... Ex sorry. 
we need to be very careful here to distinguish between criticism and censorship. Someone says something that's openly sexist or racist, you should call that call them out. Yes. You should say actually that's inappropriate yep. in, in this mm -hmm. in this classroom. Uh, if you're doing curriculum design, some books need to be left off. Uh, okay, if the course is on economic history, then you should be talking about economic history. Yeah. If the books aren't about economic history, and if they're not reputable economic history, they shouldn't be on that course. Mm. So I think Kevin and I agree that actually uh, w you should have a conscious discussion about which books are being taught, and actually values are a part of that conversation. Mm. And I think really, if we mm. can sum this up before we go to a break, there's, there, a lot of the people at, on Street Talk mm. talked about intent. Well, that's exactly yeah. right. And I think I was actually even thinking about the fact that one girl said, oh, you know, I call my friend a wog. If yeah. I hear that word, because I've got an Italian background, I'm not offended by it. But if you were to say that word in front of my father, totally different yeah. um, reaction to it. Because when it was used back in the 50s, yeah. it, it had a it lot of... It was totally derogatory. And the intent behind it was to offend. Mm. And surely that's the same today, too. I mean, I could, I could say that to you. Um, mm. and because we're friends and we would have a good laugh about it. Sure. But if I came at you with venom in my words mm. and called you that same name, it would be offensive. Like, mm. I'm from England originally and I've put up with pommy jokes <laughs> all my are. life. And you're a whinging pom. And you, <laughs> and you're I'm from an Ireland. Irish, I'm an Irish blonde. That's right. You know, what can you say? It, what can you say? Not, it's not just about offence either. It's actually often we use language to exclude people and to try to make them uncomfortable and, make, and shut them up. I mean, and, let's come, and, let's come back to that very point. Very good point. I'd, I'd love to explore that a little bit more. And uh, Sandra, thanks for popping in. Thank you. It's great to see more of Sandra and Street Talk. Head over to theexchangetv.com.au. Back with more right after this. Baba Rainbow Sheep, have you any wool? Yes, I oh yes, a oh three by four. Discussing political correctness with us are Dr. Robert Sparrow and Dr. Kevin Donnelly. Rob, you mentioned just before about how people can be politi politically incorrect by exclusion. Tell me a little bit about that. So one of the things that we're doing when we're using language is uh, uh, sort of exerting uh, power and mm. um, claiming status. And, and so if I lean over the desk to you and say, oh, that's great, little darling, you know, thanks for that, uh, that's a way of discounting everything that you say in the, yes. rest, of the, in the rest of the conversation. And so it can, it's go, it can go the other way. But no, no, I, I hear what he's saying. It can, you can't assume that relationship with someone because it could be seen as, you know, yeah. oh, hi, dear, thank you, dear. Yeah, the, 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 harm, the harmless dumb blonde joke at the yeah. beginning of the meeting uh, immediately foregrounds that the most important thing about a woman is her appearance, doesn't matter whether yeah. she's blonde or not, and not what she's actually, uh, actually saying. So the men get to speak and no one thinks, uh, you know, oh, hang on, is this the, just them being a dumb blonde? But what, uh, about, the, what about the other end when people um, use... Uh, exclusion uh, in terms of, well, I'm an academic. It doesn't matter that you've given birth to three children, for example. I've written a book on it and, uh, you know, or whatever. Th that language can also be politically incorrect when you use the biggest word to uh, describe a situation rather than, you know, something that is much more accessible. So speech is always uh, about uh, power. I mean, interestingly, one of the things that Kevin and I agree on is that words matter. If you didn't think that words matter, you wouldn't get a bee in your bonnet about political mm. correctness. Uh, I mean, if, if you're worried mm. that you can no longer call someone a wog, OK, you have to say an Italian. That's because you think that, uh, that words matter. I agree words matter, and one of the reasons why they matter is they make it harder for certain people to participate in a public conversation. I do believe we have to differentiate between political correctness or incorrectness and just being rude or offensive. Uh, you know, I think it's a broad uh, uh, scope there if we define it too broadly. Uh, for example, if I'm at home having a dinner party uh, with people and I say, wife, where's the red wine? That's offensive and I would not say that. But again... Unless you'd previously been having a joke about it and it's an in-house joke and everybody understands it. And that can happen. I think it was... But you that's know, about context and intent then again, yeah. isn't it? I think Rumpole of the Bailey always talked about she who must be obeyed. But yes. uh, it depends... Uh, 
my point being that political correctness I define more narrowly as a form of censorship that's actually trying to change the way we relate, think, talk and interact with people. So it's not just being offensive. Should some topics just remain taboo? And I'm thinking of, for example, Charlie Hebdo, uh, who obviously pushed the boundaries and suffered the consequences. Are, are there some things that we should just avoid? I think there are some uh, phrases and perhaps uh, ways of talking in particular contexts that uh, should remain uh, taboo. Actually, getting everything out there all the time is not uh, a good way to have a conversation. And uh, we all need there to be things that we're not talking about. In a conversa if we're having a conversation about one thing and I just go off on some uh, rude or irrelevant uh, tangent, that's not helpful. So there's always uh, something that's being left unsaid and should be left unsaid in any interchange. OK. Mm. Kevin, just to finish up, show us your book that you've written, please. Well, there are two, actually. One is Political Correctness that was published some years ago, which is a dictionary which is quite humorous but very serious. And uh, a little book that I wrote, Educating Your Child is Not Rocket Science, where I do talk about some of these issues related to uh, teaching literature or history, what parents need to be aware of in terms of when their child goes to school. OK, very helpful tools. And, gentlemen, you've been very helpful as well. Thank, Thank you both. You. Thank you. For coming on The Exchange. We really appreciate that. Don't forget, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas, what's important to you. What topics would you like us to address? We hope you can join us next time. Look forward to it. See you then.